The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled From Resistance to Resilience in Relapsed Refractory CLL, Sequencing Strategies for Achieving Effective Continuous Care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash HGE860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, welcome to our program from resistance to resilience and relapse refractory CLL, sequencing strategies for achieving effective continuous care. I am Megan Thompson, um, and I'm joined uh, with uh, Dr. Catherine Coombs at today's program. We've also prepared practice aids that can be used to gain quick insights on dosing, other practical information on the BTK inhibitor class in CLL, and you'll see that there are CLL Society resources to share with patients, so please be sure to download these resources before we get started. So as introduction, this is a slide showing that covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitors are core treatment options in both the frontline and relapse refractory settings for patients with CLL. So you'll see covalent BTK inhibitors include abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, all FDA approved for treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We also show that venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, has a key role in this disease. And now the non-covalent BTK inhibitor, pyrtabrutinib, is FDA approved as of December 2023 for patients with CLL who've received two or prior lines of therapy, including a BTK inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor. And there's multiple ongoing phase three uh, studies of pirtubrutinib uh, in CLL. The non-covalent BTK inhibitor nem nemtubrutinib is also um, being tested in clinical trials and is in clinical development. This slide shows that despite advances with targeted agents and targeted agents with BTK inhibitor and the BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax representing the majority of frontline recommended treatment options, looking at real world data, we still see in the utilization data a high number of patients receiving chemotherapy. So you'll see data at the bottom um, from 2020 um, to part of 2023, and still um, almost a fifth of patients uh, have received chemotherapy. And over 33% of patients did not receive recommended regimens per guidelines in uh, 2023. So this just highlights that there's still work to be done to really have our clinical practice um, reflect uh, the most recent data in terms of targeted therapies. This is data that looks at um, a relatively large data set of patients and highlights the patients who discontinue a covalent BTK inhibitor therapy and BCL2 inhibitor experience in general poor outcomes all overall. So you see um, the time at the bottom, the time from discontinuation um, to subsequent treatment failure and by line of discontinuation. Overall, this uh, represents that the outcomes after a BTK inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor generally um, are poor as of this publication in 2022. And this is more recent data presented um, in, uh, at the ASH meeting um, in 2023, looking at double exposed and double refractory CLL patients. Um, so the double exposed patients, just to highlight, are patients who received a BTK inhibitor, um, specifically a covalent BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, um, but not necessarily re being refractory or progressing on that agent. Um, and then patients who are double refractory or, or had a refractory disease to both agents. And this shows overall poor outcomes for these patients. So for example, um, double refractory patients, you can see at the bottom left, had a medium progression-free survival of 6.8 months um, versus double exposed patients had a medium progression-free survival of 15.4 months. Um, and then you see the overall survival on the right. This really highlights an unmet medical need at the time of this publication for patients 
um, who received uh, both a covalent BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, particularly the double refractory patients. So our goals for today are listed here. We're going to attempt to augment your knowledge of the mechanistic selectivity and safety differences among the covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitors. We're going to discuss uh, skills that will help you capture multiple factors that can inform sequential treatment planning with BTK inhibitors. Um, we're going to talk about the development of personalized sequential treatment plans for patients um, and examine specifically the use of covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitors, and also discuss team-based care coordination, dosing, and safety management, um, as well as aspects of patient education. So I want to thank our partners at the CLL Society, um, and you can find the CLL Society online at clsociety.org, who um, have helped partner and support this program with us. The CLL Society has many, many resources. Um, you can find them uh, listed here. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of these resources. Um, the Patient Education Toolkit uh, is a helpful educational primer uh, for patients. And then there's also a provider resource library um, that provides uh, additional patient teaching uh, materials, and these can be uh, printed out as well. So now we'll turn to our topic, reinforcing new sequential treatment pathways in relapse refractory CLL. And I'm going to start by discussing the current standards and challenges in CLL. So here you see uh, the NCCM practice guidelines for patients with CLL in the front line, and you'll see uh, they're divided in the NCCM guidelines by the TP53 status. So patients um, first in blue uh, without a deletion of the P53 gene or deletion of um, 17P or a P53 uh, mutation, and then with, and you'll see that they look pretty similar here. Um, and they're novel agent-based strategies, so you don't see uh, chemotherapy uh, listed on this slide. And here we also see from the NCCN um, some information on prognostic testing for patients with CLSLL, and we'll talk about this today during our presentation. Um, there's several methods that can be used to identify prognostic variables for patients, and this testing really should be performed prior to initial treatment and with each line of therapy, um, with the exception of IGHB mutational status, which does not change over time, patients can acquire other cytogenetic and molecular abnormalities. So I'll just highlight that testing for deletion 17P by FISH is very important. Testing for the presence or absence of a P53 mutation by DNA sequencing techniques, and then uh, it is prognostic um, if available testing for uh, the patient's karyotype, as we know that complex karyotype um, of three or more abnormalities is associated with less favorable outcomes overall. So this slide highlights that abrutinib, while um, is a very effective treatment for patients with CLL and undoubtedly um, has transformed uh, the outcomes for many patients, we now know that at the time of clinical progression on abrutinib, the majority of patients have mutations identified in the BTK cysteine 481 residue at the time of progression. These are activating mutations that lead to increased uh, phosphorylation of BTK and downstream B cell receptor signaling. A smaller proportion of patients um, also have mutations in PLC gamma 2, which is uh, immediately downstream of BTK. Uh, in the BTK signaling pathway. And resistance is a problem uh, for patients um, treated with uh, covalent BTK inhibitors, including abrutinib as seen here. Um, but the other uh, limiting factor can also be intolerance. Um, here you'll see data uh, pooled from four prospective studies of abrutinib and you can see that um, abrutinib uh, could be discontinued for multiple reasons, 
uh, predominantly um, either progression of the CLL or uh, adverse event or toxicity. And here you just see um, the B cell receptor signaling pathway. Um, as we just saw, we see cysteine 481 mutations with the calibrutinib patients. This has also been reported with xanabrutinib treated patients. There's less data on resistance to xanabrutinib than abrutinib, um, but there is one report uh, of 13 patients that uh, progressed on xanabrutinib. 10 of 13 patients had BTK cysteine 81 mutations. But seven of these patients also had a mutation in BTK L528W, um, which is a different mutation with different functional consequences. Um, and so we see some emerging heterogeneity in resistance mutations to BTK inhibitors. And this currently doesn't impact sequencing or the standard of care and more research is needed, but perhaps we'll have more information in the future. Non-covalent BTK inhibitors were developed, um, including pirtabrutinib, uh, which we'll talk more about in this uh, clinical in this presentation, um, and is now approved for clinical use. Um, and then there's others in clinical trial, including nemtabrutinib. And the, these non-covalent BTK inhibitors may address some of the limitations of covalent inhibitors, including resistance and intolerance that we just talked about. This also is a promising treatment option for patients with double exposed or double refractory CLL, which we saw earlier in the presentation, have historically poor outcomes. And these agents bind reversibly to BTK, the non-covalent inhibitors, uh, con in contrast with the covalent inhibitors that bind irreversibly. So here we, I want to direct you um, to a video that we have developed that uh, will focus on resistance to BTK inhibitors in patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Let's take a closer look at this specific enzyme, BTK, and its role in B cell malignancies. In malignant B cells, BTK can become overexpressed. With overexpression, it becomes persistently activated, initiating a signal cascade. This leads to proliferation of the malignant cell, allowing it to thrive, resulting in patients having disease progression. Covalent BTK inhibitors, such as ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, are dependent on binding the BTK site at a specific location in an irreversible fashion, resulting in inhibition of BTK activation. These drugs are incredibly effective for patients with B-cell malignancies, but unfortunately, resistance can occur. The most common resistance pathway identified is a mutation specifically at the C4A1 site, which makes it difficult for covalent BTK inhibitors to bind. This is the most common mechanism for covalent BTKI resistance in CLL and affects all agents in this class. Decreased binding efficiency results in resistance, which allows for increased BTK enzymatic activity, and ultimately for patients, disease progression. A new class of drugs called non-covalent BTK inhibitors has been shown to be effective even in patients who have disease progression and known resistance mutations after a covalent BTK inhibitor. One such agent is called pertubrutinib, which is now FDA approved in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma and CLL after at least two prior lines of therapy. This drug blocks the ATP binding site of BTK in a reversible, non-covalent fashion, which represents a different mechanism of action, and by doing so is able to overcome the resistance mutations that have occurred in patients who have progressed on a covalent BTK inhibitor. Now we're gonna turn focus and I wanna introduce my colleague, Dr. Coombs, who is going to speak now about updates on non-covalent BTK inhibitors in uh, patients with relapsed CLL. Well, thank you, Dr. Thompson. And let's uh, kick things off. So I would like to review the phase one, two Bruin trial, which is the study that assessed pertubrutinib 
you see that this trial enrolled a wide variety of patients with relapsed refractory B-cell malignancies. Of the 778 patients accrued to this trial, the majority uh, or the largest proportion had CLL-SLL, so 317 CLL-SLL patients were accrued. Pertubrutinib is a very unique drug, so in contrast to the covalent inhibitors that we've heard a lot about, pertubrutinib is a reversible uh, BTK inhibitor. And another very unique property is it has remarkable selectivity for BTK, its target, which you can see based on the kinome selectivity map on the left. So the focus of the Bruin uh, presentations that I'll be going through is on patients who have had been treated with at least a prior covalent BTK inhibitor. And so this amounted to 282 patients. And when we take a look at the efficacy data, what this waterfall plot demonstrates is a near universal reduction in lymph node size for patients treated with pertubrutinib. The color coding depicts whether patients had discontinued their prior BTK inhibitor due to progression, which is about three quarters of the patients, versus toxicity or other reasons, which was the remaining quarter. The stars indicate whether patients had or hadn't uh, had prior BCL2 inhibitor, and so all the star patients who had are those who had prior BCL2 inhibitor. The overall response rate uh, for these groups was right around 80%. And so the response rate was actually pretty similar to the larger group of patients who had had at least a prior covalent BTK inhibitor, but it was similar 79% for the patients who had had not only a prior BTK inhibitor, but also a prior BCL2 inhibitor. The pertubrutinib uh, efficacy is very impressive. And we see efficacy in patients who uh, had a variety of uh, high risk features, including uh, TP53 mutations, C481 mutations, etc. We've now seen longer follow up from the Bruin trial, which confirms these PFS benefits in these covalent BTI pretreated uh, relapse refractory CLL SLL patients. So once again, emphasizing the overall response rate of 82%, but we've now also meet, reached the median progression-free survival, which is 19.4 months for this population of patients. The recent ASH presentation uh, by Dr. Woyak demonstrated a slight differential uh, in the progression-free survival rates between patients who were naive to a BCL2 inhibitor versus those who had been previously exposed to a BCL2 inhibitor. So encouragingly, the drug works quite well in both groups with an overall response rate around 80%. However, we are seeing a slightly longer progression-free survival among the BCL2 naive patients of around 23 months compared to patients who had been previously exposed to a BCL2 inhibitor where the median progression-free survival is 15.9 months. Here is a forest plot demonstrating uh, pertubrutinib's activity in both those BCL2 naive uh, patients and the BCL2 exposed patients, demonstrating that the response rates are largely similar based on uh, the baseline characteristics of patients being accrued to the trial. I would say the one major outlier is patients with PLC gamma 2 mutations. It mechanistically uh, would make sense that perhaps patients with these downstream mutations may not have as great of responses to pertubrutinib. And you do see uh, the response rates trending slightly lower, but they're honestly still pretty reasonable around 50-55%. Uh, there are very wide error bars, which is uh, because the number of patients with these mutations is very low, only 18 uh, in total uh, based on this presentation. Nonetheless, um, I do think it's impressive to see that pertubrutinib seems to have very similar response rates, even in our highest risk patients, such as those with DEL17P and or TP53 mutation. So pertubrutinib has also been studied in combination. And so uh, of the Bruin trial, there was actually this phase 1B substudy where patients could be enrolled uh, and treated with pertubrutinib with venetoclax or pertubrutinib with venetoclax and rituximab. The number of patients accrued to these arms uh, was relatively small, so there were 15 patients treated with PERTO plus VEN and another 10 treated with PERTO plus VEN R. However, the results that we've seen uh, from either the doublet or triplet regimen are very encouraging with the progression-free survivals shown 
uh, with very high response rates around 93 to 100% whether patients are treated with PERTO with VEN or PERTO with VENR. A uh, significantly higher proportion of patients are achieving a complete remission, uh, which is uh, an expected finding when using a venetoclax in combination. And uh, the 24-month progression-free survival uh, was right around 80% for all patients. This uh, trial uh, helped support the ongoing phase three trial of PERTO with VENAR versus VENAR alone. So I'd like to review the current NCCN guidelines for CLL in the relapse setting. And so these, once again, are divided up into patients without DEL17P TP53 mutation and patients with those mutations. So here I show you uh, the uh, graphic for patients without DEL17P, where you see pertubrutinib is now listed in a couple places. And so in the second or third line therapy, you see pertubrutinib is listed as useful in certain circumstances, specifically in the setting of resistance or intolerance to prior covalent BTKI therapy, one can consider pertubrutinib. It is also listed in this uh, subset of patients um, on the bottom in patients who have relapsed or refractory disease after a prior BTKI and venetoclax-based regimen. And so this is uh, more in line with the current FDA label where patients uh, need to have two prior therapies, including a covalent BTKI and venetoclax, where uh, pertubrutinib uh, can be considered in addition to a number of other listed agents. In the DEL17P uh, TP53 guidelines, uh, pertubrutinib is also recommended in this post-covalent BTKI and double-exposed setting. So there are a lot of ongoing trials to uh, further delineate the role of pertubrutinib, including in earlier lines of therapy. And so I would like to highlight the four phase three trials where pertubrutinib is being examined in CLL and SLL. And so in addition to the trial that I mentioned where it's being compared as a triplet with Venar to Venar alone, it's also uh, being compared head-to-head -head against abrutinib, head-to-head against VR, and also head-to-head -head against an investigator choice of Idella with Retux or Benda uh, Retux in a pretreated CLL, SLL. So PERTO is not the only non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Uh, the BTK inhibitor in the non-covalent class that has been studied in a good number of patients um, is nemtibrutinib. And so this is another potent reversible inhibitor of both wild type uh, and abrutinib resistant C481 mutated BTK. I think it is a bit different than pertubrutinib um, as far as its selectivity, which we'll see later in the presentation. Uh, but I'd like to highlight the clinical data from the Bellwave uh, study which enrolled patients uh, with B-cell malignancies, but I'll highlight the CLL, SLL-treated patients here. And so they had different cohorts whether or not patients did have the C481S mutation or did not. And the number of patients accrued is uh, significantly lower, uh, of course, than the Bruin trial, which was 300-some CLL patients. So here we're seeing 57 patients total. And then among cohort A and B, it's uh, 25 and 10 patients, respectively. We do see that this drug also has activity, and so the response rate is right around uh, 56% uh, for the entire group. Here are the progression-free survival curves uh, based on uh, the most recent presentation of nemtibrutinib. And so uh, we're seeing something a little different than what we see in pertubrutinib, which seems to work uh, pretty similar between patients with and without the C481S mutation. In this trial, uh, the patients without the C481S mutation uh, actually uh, seem to have a better progression-free survival. I hesitate to use the word better because the numbers are very small, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the median uh, progression-free survival is uh, not valuable among uh, this cohort B uh, group of patients. It's only 10 patients, uh, but they seem to be doing quite well. And among the patients who do have the C481S mutation, uh, their uh, median PFS is 15.7 months. Uh, so still a very good uh, degree of activity, uh, but I'll be looking for uh, larger uh, uh, numbers of patients uh, to draw firm conclusions on the activity of this drug. With that, I would like to hand things back over to Megan. Thank you, um, Dr. Coombs, for that section of the presentation. And now um, we're going to delve a little bit further into non-covalent BTK inhibitors and review some of the data on safety.
So here you'll see a slide um, that looks at selectivity of different BTK inhibitors. Um, and you'll see a brute nib. Uh, again, uh, as a reminder, this is a covalent BTK inhibitor that binds irreversibly. Um, and then you'll see uh, the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, nemtabrutinib and pirtabrutinib. And what we're looking at here is are the kinome plots uh, and the selectivity uh, for the BTK target here. You'll see that pirtabrutinib is very selective for BTK, um, more selective uh, compared to a brutinib. And then you'll see that nemtabrutinib um, uh, with the kinome plot is a less selective non-covalent uh, BTK inhibitor um, when we compare that to, to peer to brute M. And evidence suggests that more selective BTK inhibitors have fewer off-target effects. Um, again, the clinical data here is, is all in development, but um, and we don't have any randomized data right now, but we'll review uh, the safety data we have so far um, for pirtabrutinib and nemtabrutinib. So this is data from the Bruin study. And overall, pirtabrutinib uh, at this point in time has been very well tolerated. Um, and you'll hear, see here um, all cause adverse events, um, both any grade and then highlighting grade three or higher. The most common grade three or higher uh, adverse event seen in the Bruin study was neutropenia at 28% of patients. Um, and I think one of the most striking things about pirtabrutinib um, on the data we have so far is that overall very few patients have discontinued the drug for toxicity. Um, so just two and a half percent of the uh, study population or seven patients had treatment related adverse events leading to discontinuation of pirtabrutinib. I think it's also important when we think about BTK inhibitors to think about AEs of special interest or toxicities that really were seen um, to be more common as a class, in fact, with the covalent inhibitors. And what are we seeing with non-covalent inhibitors? So again, staying with the Bruin data here and focusing on peer to brutinib, you'll see these AEs of interest that are highlighted. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight a couple, for example, um, atrial fibrillation and flutter has been seen with the covalent uh, BTK inhibitors. And so in the Bruin study, uh, there was 4.6% of patients with any grade AFib or flutter, and then 1.8% of um, patients with uh, grade 3 or higher AFib or flutter. So relatively low with the data we have uh, at this time point with pirtabrutinib. Hypertension is also a common AE seen with covalent inhibitors and so was explored as an AE of special interest here. 14% uh, with any grade uh, hypertension on the Bruin study and 4.3% with grade three or higher. And then you'll see other AEs here. I'll highlight hemorrhage, um, which grade three or higher hemorrhage was 2.1% on the Bruin study. Turning um, to nemtabrutinib, um, and, and this is data uh, from the Bell Wave study, now looking at um, the safety data. Um, so you'll see um, a data for 112 patients uh, treated here, um, and uh, you'll see any grade AEs as well as grade three or higher on the far column. Um, and when we look here, um, Again, we'll see uh, neutrophil count decrease as the most common uh, grade three or higher um, adverse event. Here are AEs of special interest, again, because of the experience with covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, the clinical trials have focused in on commonly uh, seen AEs. So for hypertension, um, the, this list of AEs uh, that are seen in five or more patients that occurred in 30% of the study uh, population here. Um, other AEs include arthralgia and rash were commonly seen. So now we're going to um, continue the discussion about the non-covalent BTK inhibitor class and now talk about interdisciplinary care, building the management team, and um, some additional um, care tips to be aware of treating patients with non-covalent BTK inhibitors.
I'm going to hand things back to Dr. Coombs for this portion of the presentation. Thank you. So, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I think it also takes a village to uh, effectively treat a CLL patient. And so this graphic uh, demonstrates um, all of the different uh, healthcare professionals that can go into the optimal management of a CLL uh, management uh, team. And so, of course, um, I'm a hematologist oncologist, but I don't work in isolation. And so I've been very lucky to uh, build my own team at uh, the institutions that I've worked with. Um, and so to highlight the role of a few other professionals, I can't state enough how important pharmacists are. Um, they uh, constantly are finding med interactions. Um, they help uh, with access to drugs, finding uh, grants when patients have high copays. Um, and so they are just a huge uh, resource. Um, the oncology nurse also hugely important. Um, they are often the first person to answer uh, patients' questions. They help with education, AE management, and of course uh, work uh, along with me uh, to uh, provide the best care. Uh, Cardio-oncologists have been actually much more important uh, than I would have anticipated um, you know, when I first started uh, in CLL you know, a long time ago now. But with AFib is a significant class effect of uh, the covalent BTKIs. I have ended up um, having many of my patients go to cardio-oncologists or just regular cardiologists, um, depending on the patient's preference, if they already know a regular cardiologist, uh, but they can be hugely helpful in uh, coordinating care in the setting of a cardiac AE or even for very high-risk patients as a preventative um, uh, visit. And then, uh, of course, we also work alongside our pathologists at varying uh, stages in the patient's care. And just to emphasize what Dr. Thompson said, I think it's very important to send our prognostic testing not only prior to the first therapy, but also at uh, subsequent lines of therapy, given uh, that uh, these things can evolve. And so BTKI uh, do have class effect toxicities. And so I'd like to review some of the selected toxicities that we can see with BTKIs. So, you know, with AFib being common, um, we always have to think about, well, if a patient develops AFib and needs anticoagulation, how can we manage that optimally? It's a recommendation to not give BTK inhibitors along with warfarin. And this is uh, due to a variety of historical reasons, uh, but warfarin was largely excluded with trials and it is uh, recommended to do non-warfarin anticoagulation. And we have a number of effective agents uh, nowadays um, that are in this class. Uh, hypertension, of course, it's a no-brainer to manage this with antihypertensives. Uh, the thing I'd like to point out is a lot of my patients I found have white coat hypertension, and so I always rely on uh, home monitoring to make sure this is bona fide hypertension um, as opposed to a white coat uh, event. And, you know, when patients have cardiac arrhythmia or AFib, of course, we have to treat these appropriately. I um, out of date on my management of AFib. And so it's always wonderful to have uh, good uh, collaborators and colleagues, uh, cardiologists, cardio-oncologists to help with co-management. I always caution my patients on the signs and symptoms of bleeding. Um, and then I always advise them, of course, to let me know if they need any procedures, given uh, that they should be holding their BTK inhibitors in the setting of uh, such procedures, uh, given the risk of bleeding. And the last point I think is important, but you know, by the time a patient goes on a BTK inhibitor, I've likely already counseled them multiple times on the risk for infection and secondary malignancies because I think these, of course, are not just from the drugs. I think they're inherent to the disease. And so this is a conversation I have even with my watchful waiting patients on how to effectively uh, minimize their risk for infection through vaccination and other common sense measures, uh, but also to stay up to date on age-appropriate cancer screening in addition to um, at least annual dermatology visits due to the risk for skin cancer. So a few points on uh, unique AEs of some of our uh, current drugs. Acalabrutinib um, does have a unique side effect, which is it has a higher incidence of headache uh, than abrutinib um, and likely higher than abrutinib, though those two haven't been compared head to head. Uh, fortunately, the headaches are usually not a reason to stop the drug. They're often short lived, resolved within the first cycle or two. But anecdotally, headaches uh, can be um, uh, minimized uh, by the use of acetaminophen, and also caffeine can be particularly helpful uh, if patients end up with that AE. Xanabrutinib um, has been uh, seen uh, to lead to maybe a little bit higher in the way of neutropenia, 
And so um, when this occurs, uh, for the first occurrence, uh, they do recommend dose interruption if it's severe and you can use growth factor support um, at uh, one's discretion. I uh, typically would consider that if it's a severe neutropenia. Pertubertinib um, can also be associated with neutropenia. And so um, in the setting of a severe neutropenia, um, and we'll go through the details on that later, uh, once again, one can interrupt until recovery to grade one or baseline. Um, and for the first occurrence, you're able to restart at the full dose of 200 milligrams once daily. I'd also like to mention um, for some other intolerances that can't be managed with supportive care, sequencing to a second generation BTKI is a useful strategy, especially in the setting of a brutinib intolerance. And so uh, this is well supported uh, by uh, phase two trials. Um, so a calibrutinib specifically highly effective in the setting of a brutinib intolerance and probably about three quarters of the time uh, the patients have improved tolerability when making that switch. Similarly, xanabrutinib has been studied uh, not only in the setting of a brutinib intolerance, but we've actually also recently seen data using xanu in the setting of a cala intolerance uh, with similar rates of success as far as uh, the measurement of improved tolerability. Uh, it's also listed in the NCCN guidelines to sequence to a non-covalent uh, BTKI after uh, covalent BTKI intolerance. Um, and so I think this would depend on, uh, you know, how many uh, covalent BTKI as a patient has gone through. I certainly may consider this um, in a patient who um, has had similar side effects uh, from uh, the covalents, which occasionally occurs. So, there are a lot of drug interaction considerations, and so um, this slide depicts uh, the dosing uh, instructions uh, for patients with all of our approved BTK inhibitors, both covalent and then PERTO being the only non-covalent that's FDA approved. And so this once again emphasizes uh, the utility of having a, a good uh, care team and I, of course, look through the meds myself, but I am imperfect and it's wonderful to work with pharmacists who can catch things that I miss. And so um, there are considerations, uh, of course, with dosing with strong CYP3A4 uh, inhibitors, moderate inhibitors, and of course, inducers. I'd like to mention that this information, uh, which is a lot to digest, um, is available as a downloadable practice aid, which you can use as a reference after our program. So with that, I would like to uh, segue into our case forum, which will be looking at the sequential treatment planning for the path of least CLL resistance. Megan, I'd like you to go ahead and take our first case. Thanks so much. Um, so now uh, we're going to delve into some case-based examples. So we're starting here um, with our first patient, um, this is a patient progressing on a covalent uh, BTK inhibitor. So Alex is 78. Um, he presented with symptomatic CLL in 2018. Um, at that time, had um, these symptoms, um, drenching uh, night sweats. Um, comorbidities include diabetes as well as uh, COPD and ECOG performance status of 1%. Um, we see the white count, 250,000, hemoglobin, 9, uh, platelets, 70,000, um, so with cytopenias um, that will, were felt to be uh, disease-related after workup in this case. Um, and then looking at his cytogenetic and molecular testing, um, we see he has an unmutated IGHV status um, as well as the presence of both a uh, deletion of the p53 gene and a mutation in the p53 gene on next generation sequencing. So for initial treatment, um, he initiates a brutinib uh, at standard dosing of 420 milligrams daily. Um, and after four years on covalent BTK inhibitor therapy with a brutinib, he has disease progression. Um, so now at age 82, um, he has a performance uh, status of two. Um, so we're going to delve into, you know, potential uh, treatment options here. Dr. Coombs, um, what are some initial thoughts uh, when you see this case on um, what you're thinking, what factors are going into therapy selection? Um, so my first thought is, you know, I think abrutinib was a great first line therapy for this patient. And uh, we have to go back in time four years. And I think that was um, Akala, you know, is 
available, but maybe not with the the CLL label. And so I think he was managed appropriately. I think Abrutinib has a great track record in patients with Dell 17P. He had a kind of early progression. And so I think the median um, based on 10-year follow-up data that we saw at this year's ASH is quite a bit longer than four years. So it's it's um, you know a little worrisome for um, how he's going to do with his future therapies. Um, and now he's older. And so what I would think about as far as his options are, um, you know, what therapy is going to be the best tolerated for him, but also effective. And so I think the FDA uh, label and our current evidence uh, supports venetoclax-based therapies. But I am um, thankful that we also have an additional option with pertubrutinib, which I think, you know, could be in his future as well um, if he is a healthy 82-year-old and, you know, may have another, you know, I don't know, five uh, 10 years of life ahead of him. Absolutely. Um, and just to highlight a few points, um, I think it's important, and we've talked about this a couple times, but, you know, do we need to repeat the prognostic assessment? Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, you can acquire um, deletion uh, 17P or P53 mutation as well as other cytogenetic abnormalities. Um, I think that, you know, he had these uh, at the time of, you know, initial treatment um, and it's, it's common that they would persist, but I would repeat um, that testing fish as well as next generation sequencing um, as it's helpful to know in a higher risk feature and, and more common in the relapse setting to have these TP53 aberrancy. I think another point um, that uh, is helpful for discussion is thinking about resistance mutations and whether um, resistance testing is standard, should be performed um, in this setting. And so, you know, we reviewed earlier in the presentation with a brute nib. Um, the majority of patients do have these BTK cysteine 481 uh, mutations. Um, there are different tests out there. There's next generation sequencing um, tests, targeted panels that include these mutations. Um, and then there's more sensitive methods available um, more selectively, things like digital droplet PCR to test for BTK mutations. Um, I would say if it's available, it can be helpful information to have. But um, two kind of points on that are, you know, one, we don't, um, make the decision to change therapy based on presence or absence of one of these mutations. It's really the clinical picture as the patient clinically progressing um, because these mutations can actually occur prior to clinical progression. Um, and so um, while it is additional information, it doesn't make the decision to change therapy or not. Um, and I would say it's not um, standard, um, but if available can add some additional information. And then um, I think uh, Dr. Coombs hit really nicely on this, you know, venetoclax-based therapy um, is, uh, there's a lot of data to support its use in this setting, um, but also now peer to brutinib um, can be an option um, as NCCN listed um, under uh, certain circumstances as we saw before and has data to support its use uh, from the Bruin study here. Um, so I'd say to summarize this case, um, prognostic testing should be repeated prior to each line of treatment. The CLL can undergo clonal evolution, and these um, mutations can be acquired at progression, um, for example, on covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, the one thing I'll say is IGT status uh, does not need to be repeated. That is the exception, as that should not change over time. Uh, we can do resistance testing. Um, but with the caveat that patients can develop these mutations prior to clinical progression. So the mutations alone um, are not an indication to make a treatment decision or switch therapy. And we have data now with venetoclax-based therapy or peer to brutinib uh, for patients progressing on covalent BTK inhibitors. So changing the case up a little bit, um, so... Alex, our same patient um, with the same baseline uh, characteristics, um, undergoes uh, treatment with abrutinib, but then discontinues uh, at the four-year mark due to uh, persistent arthralgias despite intervention. So this is discontinuation now, not for clinical progression or development of acquired resistance, but actually for toxicity. 
So uh, as we saw in data presented by Dr. Coombs earlier, the treatment options are a little bit different in this case. Um, and so we do have data to support switch uh, if it, the discontinuation is for toxicity um, to another covalent BTK inhibitor, so either a calbrutinib or xanabrutinib, um, rather than switching classes of therapies altogether. Um, I think, you know, the role of the team is really important here. Um, and in the assessment of whether to switch therapies, it, it does require some assessment of what that toxicity was. So if it was, for example, um, major hemorrhage, um, you know, the other BTK inhibitors do, covalent inhibitors do have that risk as well. And so you might want to switch to a venetoclax based regimen in that case. Um, same thing with atrial fibrillation. You would want to make sure that the atrial fibrillation um, was well controlled, that the patient was plugged in with a cardiologist um, for you know management and kind of a risk benefit discussion of trying a covalent inhibitor alternatively as opposed to switching to a venetoclax based regimen or a non covalent inhibitor. So really assessing that specific toxicity is really critical in determining a rechallenge with a covalent inhibitor. Um, class or um, switching uh, in that case. So I just want to highlight at this point um, the CLL Society's Test Before Treat program. So there's really great resources that the CLL Society has put together here um, that provide some guidance on biomarker testing recommendations. There's a downloadable patient teaching handout um, and you can also request uh, hard copies uh, to have on hand in the office. So I'd encourage you to check these out. Um, they're available on the CLL Society website. And there's also the free online patient education toolkit. This has a ton of information on it. Um, you can visit uh, clsociety.org to learn more. A um, lot of patient education resources here, um, and uh, for a, a disease like CLL, this is uh, incredibly important given the number of options out there and given um, the um, uh, number of years patients really uh, live alongside this disease. A uh, great resource to educate patients. So I'm going to hand it over uh, to Dr. Coombs um, as we uh, discuss a uh, different case this time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson. So this is Christine. Uh, she is an 82-year-old woman who was first diagnosed in 2016. She was asymptomatic and so appropriately was on watchful waiting. However, she developed these symptoms in 2019 where treatment, of course, was recommended. Her prognostic testing showed she had unmutated IGHV, no uh, DEL17P, and she had hypertension as her only comorbidity and her performance status was an ECOG-1. Her first line treatment was with a calibrutinib. However, unfortunately, she also had an early uh, relapse in February 2021. And so her second line uh, treatment was venetoclax with rituximab, uh, an appropriate choice at this time. Um, unfortunately, she developed progressive disease in December 2023. And this was nine months after the end of treatment. Her performance status at this time is now an ECOG of two. And so uh, just to pause there, um, Megan, any thoughts on uh, this patient's course? Yeah, so this is um, an interesting case. A couple of things to highlight um, here. Um, you know, we have the key bait, some key baseline information on mutated IGHV, no deletion 17P here, um, performance status of one. So a calibrutinib um, selected as frontline therapy. Um, very appropriate treatment choice and, and, you know, with data that we've seen to support this use. Um, a very early relapse though, you know, just two years into covalent BTK in inhibitor initiation, um, and then um, going on to standard of care therapy with a Murano regimen with venetoclax rituximab, um, and a short relapse after end of treatment. So, you know, relapsing nine months after end of treatment is on the higher risk side. So now we have what we ha have this, you know, a patient who's been exposed to a covalent inhibitor discontinued for progression and now BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax based therapy and relapse really, really shortly after 
Um, so a uh, very high risk patient. I, I would put this into a, a double refractory category here. Um, and so, you know, based on what we've seen earlier in the presentation, a couple of things definitely should get repeat prognostic testing. You know, did this patient acquire a P53 mutation or other high risk complex karyotype or other high risk cytogenetic or molecular feature? Um, and then um, when I'm thinking about treatment options, I think this is a space where Pirta Brutinib really uh, does have data from the Bruin study um, as the as the new standard of care in this setting. Uh, those are all of my thoughts. And so um, I would agree that this is double refractory and we'll go through kind of what the difference between double refractory and double exposed is on the next slide. Um, and I think you highlighted all of the points uh, that I uh, already would have highlighted. And so you know, I would say there's not um, a total consensus on the difference between double exposed and double refractory. Um, it's been suggested that progression in under two years is uh, one um, cutoff to define someone as refractory to venetoclax. But this is based on expert opinion. Of course, we need more data to better define, you know, what what is, you know, the optimal duration of remission to consider venetoclax retreatment. But double exposed is the term we use when patients have relapsed CLL after both at least exposure to a PTI and a covalent PTI and VEN. And then refractory, double refractory is the term we use when they're uh, relapsed after progression on uh, the BTKI and venetoclax. Um, so, and diving back into our case, let's see what happened. Um, so she... Um, relapsed nine months following the end of treatment. And so I think uh, both Dr. Thompson and I agree, this is a very short remission. And so this would be best uh, classified as double refractory. And so as far as our options for our patient, um, thankfully, pertubrutinib is now FDA approved and is clearly uh, the best choice for this patient in absence of a clinical trial. So to continue on with her case, uh, she uh, goes on pertubrutinib 200 milligrams once daily. However, um, she though she responded to therapy, she did experience a grade three neutropenia um, that uh, had an ANC of 0.7, but she also had a fever. And so we do see neutropenia with pertubrutinib. Uh, fortunately, febrile neutropenia is not as common. However, febrile neutropenia uh, does um, uh, necessitate uh, holding the drug. Um, and so here, i just like to highlight some of the safety recommendations based on pertubrutinib's uh, label. And so pertubrutinib uh, should uh, be uh, held in the setting of uh, neutrophil count um, in the grade 3 range, which is under 1, uh, but above 0.5 or 0.5 or greater in the setting of fever. And it should also uh, be held in the setting of grade four neutropenia that lasts seven or more days. And so if this is the first occurrence, the recommendation for the package insert is to interrupt until recovery to grade one or baseline, and you can restart at the original dose of 200 milligrams once daily. So next, I'd like to just uh, highlight, once again, another wonderful resource from the CLL Society. Uh, this is their medicine cabinet that can help inform patients about dosing and safety uh, considerations for a number of these novel agents. And there, of course, are free hard copies available upon request, and these are non-branded and patient-friendly. And so um, I think it's a really good uh, resource uh, for patients, uh, especially um, perhaps those treated in the community uh, where perhaps these drugs aren't used uh, with as great of regularity, or just for patients to educate themselves, which I think can often be very empowering. So I'd like to mention that we have collected these CLL Society resources as a downloadable practice aid, which you can use as a reference after our program. So I'd like to switch up this case a bit. And so let's imagine Christine, our same patient as before, instead of being treated with a calibrutinib in the front line, enrolled on a clinical trial of a brutinib plus venetoclax. I'll remind you that this has been studied in a number of prospective trials. It's technically not FDA approved in the U.S., though it is approved in Europe and many other countries. Uh, it's a fixed duration of both abrutinib and venetoclax over the course of a year. And so this is what she received, um, but unfortunately she relapsed in 2024. And so um, assuming she started treatment in 2020 um, and was on the therapy uh, for about um, a year, um, 15 months if you include the abrutinib lead-in, She's had about three years um, in between um, uh, ending treatment and now progressing. 
And so how would our treatment options change? And so I think um, we may see some of these patients in the clinic. A lot of patients have been treated with these combinations. And so, uh, Dr. Thompson, would you like to uh, discuss a few of your thoughts on what her options uh, might be? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great case to discuss because, as you mentioned, um, there are patients who have been treated with this regimen as well as other BTK, BCL2 inhibitor combinations, you know, on a clinical trial um, uh, often. And then we enter really um, this zone where we have some uh, data, but not a ton. So um, a lot of uh, data that's being gathered right now. Um, I think it's always important to think about, you know, why the patient discontinued their prior therapy. So in this case, it was because they completed the fixed duration plan therapy. So we don't really have any reason, um, you know, with that treatment free uh, remission of um, about three years to think that the patient is resistant to the BTK inhibitor, to venetoclax or to the combination. Um, and so, you know, outside of a clinical trial, I think, you know, again, acknowledging there's not really a standard in this setting, um, you could consider retreatment with one or both agents. So really, um, I think outside of a clinical trial, what I would do, um, you know, is either a covalent BTK inhibitor retreatment or a retreatment with a venetoclax-based regimen. In the context of a clinical trial, um, there are trials that are, you know, looking at retreatment with a BTK inhibitor and, and venetoclax combination. Um, you know, that is, is still investigational at that point. And then, you know, the question will come up, you know, should this patient get piridabrutinib, you know, as a non-covalent BTK inhibitor because technically they've had a covalent inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor? I don't think we have, you know, such great data on that class of agents. And I would um, you know, be tempted to to stay, you know, with a covalent inhibitor or venetoclax-based uh, retreatment strategy. But I acknowledge there's a lot of uh, data that needs to be gathered in this space um, and a lot of different directions potentially to go here. Totally agree. And so um, I think that's a good segue into thinking about how we sequence our uh, therapies. And so, of course, it depends on, well, what did a patient get in the first line and then what are our next best steps? And so for uh, patients um, who start with a covalent BTK inhibitor, um, I'd say the current standard of care is venetoclax, uh, typically uh, with rituximab, um, which is um, you know well studied. Um, of course, we've already alluded to the fact that the Murano trial that led to approval didn't have a lot of post-covalent BTKI patients, uh, but nonetheless, this is a well-vetted regimen that um, I've been using for the past many years. However, non-covalent BTIs can be considered in certain circumstances, and that is um, listed in the NCCN guidelines, though it's not uh, technically the current FDA label. Um, Single-agent venetoclax is also another uh, great option. It's in this third-line setting that I think uh, the use of pertubrutinib is, is much more clear. And so if a patient falls into this double refractory range, which, you know, a lot of people say two years, I might think of uh, retreatment then if it's a little less, um, depending on how well they tolerated the VEN. And so, you know, acknowledging that timeline isn't set in stone. But if it's clear double refractory, like our patient case where she progressed nine months after end of therapy, I think non-covalent BTKI is the way to go. However, if they had a longer remission and they did you know, really well with the venetoclax, I think you could um, have a little bit more uh, leeway between your choices where non-covalent BTKI is certainly appropriate, but, you know, maybe ven retreatment is also a good option. And so moving into another uh, commonly used standard of care in the front line is ven G. I use a lot of it in my own practice. In the second line, I think we have options. And I think my enthusiasm for retreatment with ven um, goes up the longer that the patient is in remission. And so if a patient had a really long remission and did quite well with the VEN in the front line, I would be very enthusiastic about retreating this patient with VEN uh, plus minus the CD20. However, if it's a shorter remission or if there were significant tolerability issues with the venetoclax, it's also very appropriate to use a covalent BTKI in the second line setting. And then once again, when we get into the third line, we're thinking about non-covalent BTKI, especially if there's not a long duration of remission, um, if you did then retreatment as the second line 
And just as Dr. Thompson alluded to, if there are patients who are getting fixed duration covalent BTI and venetoclax in the front line, we really have very little data on what to do in the second line. There was a really nice presentation at ASH uh, looking at uh, the patients treated on the Captivate trial who relapsed and got retreated either with single agent abrutinib or the combo of abrutinib plus venetoclax. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like resistance mutations are are seen uh, with any frequency. There were no BTK or PLC gamma 2 mutations. And so I think retreatment with either of these agents is appropriate uh, based on uh, everything Dr. Thompson uh, discussed um, in the prior slide. And so I would like to lump in a different category here, which is intolerance of the BTKI. So I've primarily been focused on patients who progress on these agents um, during uh, my discussion on this um, sequencing landscape. However, in a patient with intolerance, I always uh, would encourage uh, the consideration of sequencing to a more selective covalent BTKI, such as Acala or Xanu. I'd also like to point out that, you know, if a patient's in clinical, a good clinical remission, you don't have to start another agent right away. I am always a fan of a treatment holiday and uh, waiting uh, for a patient then to progress um, after a period of watchful waiting and then um, applying one of these agents. However, additional options are sequencing to pertubrutinib, and you can also sequence to venetoclax. And so I've done that frequently for patients who I just thought it was a little too risky to go back to a covalent BTKI. And I think the perfect example is a patient with a severe bleeding event, given that that's something that is relatively common between all of our uh, covalent uh, BTK classes. So some final take-home points on our modern BTKI sequencing and relapse refractory CLL. I do think that pertubrutinib is very clearly the new standard of care in double refractory CLL. Of course, we need to continue to do more work to understand what double refractory really is. What is that optimal time period where you can reconsider then retreatment? Uh, there are, of course, these additional settings where uh, pertubrutinib, as our uh, only approved non-covalent BTI, uh, may be useful. And so I certainly would also consider its use in double exposed CLL. But in this situation, I would just weigh the pros and cons of then retreatment um, with the patient, which would be influenced by their prior length of remission. And then, of course, how well did they tolerate the then? Next, another setting to think about uh, pertubrutinib is in the setting of covalent BTKI intolerance. And so in the setting, switching to an alternative covalent or venetoclax is, in fact, supported by current evidence and guidelines. But uh, the Bruin trial, in addition to the NCCN, also support uh, the switch to a non-covalent BTKI pertubrutinib specifically in this setting. So with that, we um, have already received a few questions uh, from the audience, and we uh, welcome additional questions that uh, we'd love to handle uh, during this time period. So, Dr. Thompson, I think one of these questions is important, and so I'm really curious on, on what you do here. Uh, are you, in fact, testing all patients for BTKI uh, resistance mutations at relapse? And what's your rationale uh, for testing um, uh, prior to starting a BTKI even? Yeah, I think this is a, a great question. I mean, um, you know, as we talked about during the presentation, um, these uh, BTK mutations we do know uh, occur in many patients at the time of relapse on a covalent BTK inhibitor. And, you know, we've even um, seen data on reports uh, of additional mutations with non-covalent BTK inhibitors. I would say I do test uh, patients, um, you know, at uh, the time of progression on a covalent BTK inhibitor um, for these resistant mutations. Um, but part of that is is due to I do have access to that testing. And like I mentioned, um, I don't think it should determine, you know, switching therapies. I think the big take home is that, um, you know, it's additional information to have about the, the CLL biology, but at this time, the presence or absence of a mutation doesn't determine that the patient is progressing on that treatment. That is really, really the clinical um, uh, significance. So I think a lot of this will be um, at, on the availability of the testing, um, uh, and um, I do do baseline um, genetic sequencing prior to each line of therapy, uh, that does include uh, the BTK, uh, you know, testing. Um, but I think the take homes are uh, that this is additional information, but the clinical uh, assessment of progression really, really is uh, uh, key and should be determining treatment. 
the other question that jumps out to me on here, um, Dr. Coombs, is I think you highlighted this well in the Bruin data, but kind of the experience of non-covalent BTK inhibitors in um, DEL-17 CLL, or even we can like think about this more broadly, um, high-risk CLL, uh, either from your experience or the, the Bruin study experience. Yeah, so I think that was um, one of the most impressive things um, uh, as far as being an investigator on Bruin. I put some very high-risk patients on the trial, and I... Um, I think it also agrees with the clinical trial data. The drug works in everybody. I mean, well, not everybody. It's an 80 percent overall response rate. But you know, of the patients I treated, I had a very uh, significant proportion of patients with high, very high risk features, very heavily pretreated, and I um, have been profoundly impressed with the efficacy of the drug. And I think when we look at the larger population of uh, patients uh, from the Bruin trial, um, it, the the response rates are very similar based on um, all of these high risk features, and so the question specifically alludes to DEL seventeen P, but the response rates are are very similar, and the progression free survival very similar, and so the drug just performs you know phenomenally well even in the highest risk uh, patients, and so um, my experience has been very favorable, and it would definitely be my my go to um, in uh, patients who had been you know failed by their other standards of uh, therapy as we've discussed. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It, it, it appears uh, to have great peer-to-brutinum, great activity in um, high-risk um, subgroups. So thank you so much for your attention today um, and for joining us. Um, a really informative presentation. I want to thank Dr. Coombs um, for her collaboration um, in this program um, and also um, can uh, join us um, uh, the conversation on X at Peerview. Uh, so thank you for your attention today. I really enjoyed uh, interacting with you in the this event. And thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash HGE 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.